Welcome everybody in the lecture hall. Welcome everybody on Zoom. Welcome everybody from the future. Today we spend most of our time querying trees uh, using the JSONIC language. Um, I'll take the time to drive you through it. Uh, I'd also insist that it's really just a um, newer, more generic SQL that can also handle nestedness and heterogeneity, but it, um, it can also do everything SQL does. So everything you've learned, like selection, projection, grouping, ordering, and so on, all of that is also part of, uh, of JSONIC. But you'll see that it's much easier than lateral views and, uh, and uh, 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 all this complexity with adding dots uh, to SQL. So I'll start with uh, questions uh, that I would like to ask you on the quick on clicker, and uh, then we'll proceed with the, the rest of the lecture. So this is my first question to you. Which of the following adjectives qualify a well-designed query language? Multiple answers possible. Functional, imperative, low level, declarative. Right, so we have a few answers coming in. So let's see what you are saying. Functional and declarative seem to be quite popular. You for imperative, low level, you can still change your mind. And wow, people change their minds. And it turns out that the majority is correct indeed. Functional and declarative, which brings me to the second question. Why should a query language be functional and declarative? So that query can be parallelized, multiple answers possible, right? So that a query can be parallelized or so that an optimizer can make the query faster than it would have been with the literal execution of the user's query, exactly as the user said. Or is it in order to delegate the details of the execution of the query to a machine rather than doing it yourself? Or is it because queries are more concise and easier to read and understand? Multiple answers possible. Functional and declarative. So you know the difference between declarative and imperative, right? Uh, imperative is like the recipe. Put the sugar, put the butter, put in the oven at that temperature and so on. That's imperative. That's like Python, Java, C++, and so on. And functional is more like going to the Menza and asking for the veggie menu. It's, uh, that's mainly the difference. And so you might have heard of uh, Haskell, uh, F-sharp, uh, Camel, and so on, but the most popular uh, functional and declarative languages are really the query languages, like uh, SQL and uh, many others. All right, we have a few answers, so let's take a look then at what you are saying here. Aha, you like the second, third, and fourth. Only one person likes the first answer, so that queries can be parallelized. Well, all four are correct, the four of them. It's all the bonus that you get from a functional and declarative language. Since it's fully declarative, you are totally free to optimize in any way you want, as long as the results come out as expected. Uh, it's also easier to read, it's more concise, it's shorter, takes less space. Uh, you don't need to worry about the details because the machine is going to take care of it. For example, if you just want to sort or to join, you don't have to worry about the details of how you sort or join. You just say you want to sort or join and uh, the engine is doing it. And parallelize, yes, indeed. In fact, that's exactly what we are about to do now with uh, JSONIC because actually JSONIC works on billions or if dozens of billions it was tried of, uh, of uh, items or rows or whatever you call it, right? So it can also be parallelized and I will, uh, I will say a few words about that. Uh, all right, and speaking of JSONIC, I'd like to show you 
something that I highly recommend you do at also as part of the exercises because the team, the TA team also prepared something uh, for you. But if you go to the web page uh, where there is the specification and everything, uh, you click, sorry, that's in the way, you click on live tutorial here, uh, right there, and you get into some, uh, in that case, it's uh, hosted on the uh, Google Colab, but you have no obligation to use it. You can also uh, make it work uh, locally uh, uh, or with any other. Um, and so the idea is that you first click here in order to load the uh, the driver and everything so that it can connect, right? It's just like the same as was, as was done before. You don't really need to understand what's going on here. The only thing is that here, it, this is using the public server. So there is a few servers in the cloud that are very small. It's just one gigabyte of memory, like uh, ridiculously small, but it's just to play around. And if you run it on your laptop, uh, directly, then you just replace it with localhost. Localhost is just the uh, the name of your own machine uh, when you connect to your own machine. All right. So now this is all done. Don't need to understand what that does. And now, of course, there's always the demo effects that as soon as you want to show it, it breaks. But just hoping for the best. You see, this is a query here, JSONic. Don't worry. I explain to you what it does uh, in the slides. That's what we we'll spent two hours on today. But you see the result here. Basically, what you can do, if you want to take some time, it's going to be more or less similar to what I will do today. But you can take the time to click your way through the queries here, execute them, see what comes out, read the text, and so on. You can also modify them if you, if you want to play around and see what it does, right? So one to 10. Uh, what's happened? Oh, yeah, double comma. Uh, there you go. You see, you can just modify the queries, edit them, play around. Uh, that's how it works. And you will have them. That's on uh, exam day as well. Something uh, um, also uh, a Jupyter notebook. All right. So I'm going back to the slides. Uh, one, I think. And since I spoke about the exam, I can tell you a few words. Because I know that some of you are wondering. I usually tell it towards the end because, of course, I want you to learn and focus on learning during the semester. Um, but in essence, the exam is going to be a computer-based exam. It's going to be in a room either in, usually, I, I cannot guarantee anything, but usually it's either in the main building or in early con, in, a, in an ETH building over there, in a big room with plenty of computers. Every one of you has one computer. And uh, you can pick a US keyboard if you prefer uh, compared to a Swiss keyboard. Just tell us in advance. It's um, going to be a Moodle quiz. At most, 60 graded questions. I told the TA team, right? More than 60, I start deleting them. So at most, 60 questions. Uh, you will have plenty of time. So 60 questions, I think, uh, the duration of the exam. Uh, I think it's three hours, but just check still in the course catalog. But this is plenty of time to, to solve them. Uh, and uh, this is a Moodle quiz. So it means that the questions look very much like uh, what you've had uh, for the bonus quizzes, except there is an exception is that the bonus quizzes during the week, they are only meant to make you think and focus, you know, make you learn the material, do some research and so on and so on. Of course, the questions on the exam day, uh, they are uh, much more uh, self-contained, precise uh, than the, the bonus quizzes, right? So it's, uh, it's a slightly different style. Uh, in fact, there is research that, uh, I don't know if you've heard of uh, Professor Kapoor. Um, he showed that if you do not design the, uh, the quizzes during the semester as precisely as exam questions, it leads to higher performance at the exam. And the reason is that if the questions during the semester are less precise, it pushes you to do some research. You Google things around, then you also write emails to the TA team saying you disagree and you have another interpretation and so on. This is great for learning. And then when you go to the exam, there, there were actually real life experiments, I think that were done in, uh, in high schools in India, for example, and, uh, and uh, it actually uh, pushes performance and grades up. Um, so 60 questions, most of them are theoretical, uh, multiple choice, uh, enter uh, some, some number, drag and drop, and so on. And some of them are programming exercises. 
because you will have software pre-installed on your computer, will just work, you don't have to worry about installing it. And you will have exactly four kind of programming tax, tasks, four of them. But there's no surprise because that's things we've done during the semester. The first one is PostgreSQL, SQL. So you will have a pre-populated database with a few tables and you'll be asked to write SQL in order to answer a few questions. So we ask the questions in English. We ask you uh, to enter a string or a number or whatever, and this is graded. We also ask you for the query, but this is ungraded, the query. It's just for us, for our archive, or if you want to argue later and you want a proof of the query you wrote. Uh, so we still recommend you paste it. So SQL, PostgreSQL. Second, you'll have PySpark, which is basically the Python version of Spark where you query with RDDs, remember, resilient distributed data sets. So we'll typically give you a data set, usually uh, JSON, might be Parquet, but usually it's JSON. So that's the second one, PySpark. Third one is Spark SQL slash data frames because uh, uh, some of you prefer the data frame transformation API to Spark SQL, and that's fine. You, you're free to do either, but basically Spark SQL to, to shorten it. Uh, and here too, we give you a JSON file and uh, you, 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 it will already open in the Jupyter notebook. You will have pre-populated cells. And fourth, JSONic, which we, are, which we are doing today, right? All of these will be in a Jupyter notebook. So on exam day, you will arrive you will have a Jupyter notebook, you click on a button, it opens, and you will have everything in there with a few queries to get you started and a few empty cells where you can type your comments. All right, so this is what to expect at the exam. I will also, uh, uh, next week for the final lecture, you, uh, I, I, I can also uh, complete what I said if you have more questions or anything, uh, and uh, just to make sure that you know what to expect. Something else is we will give you the data sets in advance before the exam. We'll tell you exactly what data there will be, exactly what tables this will be, so you can practice all you want. We will re release the past exams uh, as PDFs. Uh, they are already with the FIS, but we'll also put them on the Moodle. We will even release the data sets of past exams. And in fact, we, we have what we call this, uh, this uh, uh, um, uh, Docker Compose magic box, right? It's just a Docker, just do Docker Compose up. And you'll have all of the Jupyter notebooks of all past exams popping up in there with all data pre-populated. It should just work because the TA team did a really great work. We sat together and, and tried to make it work. Uh, so that should make it much easier because in previous years, the students tried to install it themselves, you know, uh, but, but, but now it should just have be a setup that just works similar to the exercises. All right, any questions on that or should I just proceed with Jason? Who is less stressed now about the exam, now that I told you these things? You have more info, right? Okay, good. I don't know the date yet. Uh, it's decided by the examinations office. Is it released, the date? I don't think so. Oh, today, okay, yeah, very good. So they should tell us very soon the exact day. We have no control over that. It's all decided centrally, uh, and then you'll know, but it will be sometimes in August or the first days of September. All right. So let's get back to what will keep us busy for today. Um, first, a few slides to put you back in the mood of what we, what we started last week. Why are we doing that? Because you're gonna tell me there's already SQL, so why do we need something else? Well, this is the reason. SQL was designed for tables. It means the data uh, has atomic integrity, relational integrity, integrity, and domain integrity. So this is what you see on the left. It's flat, it's homogeneous. This is most of the use cases in real life. 80%, perhaps even 90% of the use cases, the first automatic thought you should have is you start a database project is, can I use SQL? That should be your first thought. But in some cases, SQL is not good enough. And SQL is not good enough when you move to the right because you have data that might be a bit messy. It's not simply organized cleanly in a flat homogeneous table. You might have extra values, missing values, invalid values, meaning not all the same type in the same column, so that breaks domain integrity. You might have nested values, so that breaks atomic integrity, and extra and missing values that breaks relational integrity. So we break all of the rules. Uh, people tried to push SQL to its limit by adding a few dots, by adding lateral views, by adding variant types, and so on and so on. But none of that is really convenient because you, you are just trying to push SQL to do something it was never designed to do. 
So this is why there are other languages, uh, and in particular JSONIC that we're using for the lecture uh, today. But again, a language is a language. You want, once you learn one, you can very easily learn many others very rapidly because the principles are the same. So I already showed you last time that in essence, a query language, the same is true for SQL, right? But even more so for JSONIC, it's that it's a data calculator. A calculator manipulates numbers. Here we just manipulate collections of rows or collections of items, right? So this is a JSONIC query. You can actually type it. If you have your, uh, the, the, the try it out page that I showed you earlier open, you can actually type that and you will uh, get the results. Do not remove the percent percent JSONIC, right? In, in the cells of the notebook, there is a percent percent JSONIC and then the query. This, the percent percent JSONIC is important because it tells Jupyter that it's supposed to execute it as JSONIC, right? But if after the percent percent JSONIC on the next row, you, pu you put that, then that would just work. Okay. Well, technically, I think if you remove the percent percent JSONIC, it will work, but that's because it's going to be executed as Python, and that also works as Python. Okay. Uh, and this was another example I gave you last time where uh, it's not just numbers, it's actually JSON. So in that case, we take an object that has a key foo associated with an array of three integers, and then we apply to that object dot foo, which basically takes the value associated with foo, that's the array three, four, five. This double square bracket one basically picks the item at the first position. So the first position in the array, that's a three. And then we add three. So three plus three gives us six. Who understands this query? Okay, great. And we'll see, we'll just see many more of them today. I'm just going to present you all the bells and whistles. All right, this is another one that uh, basically, if you remember this explode function in Spark SQL, uh, this is how we do things in JSONIC. You just put these double square brackets and just that just uh, opens up the array. That would be the array three, four, five. So it's a single item, the array. But if you open it up, you end up with three items, a three, a four, and a five, right? So this is called the array unboxing. But again, again, I'll come back to that. I'll, uh, in, in, we have, to, we have uh, two hours today to do all that. One to four is uh, a, special, uh, a special expression that generates a range of numbers, right? So you can also do it with one to a million and it will just generate a sequence of a million numbers from one to a million and so on. Okay. Um, this is another one. Again, it's just the appetizer because I'll come back to all of this. This is a four. It's a bit like a select from where in SQL but I'll show you later why. And at the same time, it's a bit like a for loop in Python or in Java or in C++. We already saw a for loop. Okay. So caution, this is a declarative for loop. This is not an imperative for loop, right? So I'll come back to the semantics of that. But basically it says that for every item between three and five, so three, four, and five, it's gonna bind it to variable dollar $i. Dollar $i is a variable. Um, and then for every value of dollar $i, so first for three, then for four, then for five, it's going to give you a JSON object where dollar $i is going to be the key. Of course, it has to convert it to a string because a number cannot be a key in JSON, right? So this is why we add the quotes. So the key three associated with, and here you see dollar $i times dollar $i, so that's the square of the number, right? So three associated with nine, four associated with 16, five associated with 25. So the output of this query on the left is a sequence of three items that are three JSON objects, and uh, this is what you get, okay? This is an equivalent query where instead of saying three to five, I just put them in some more complex things. And what I want to show you here is that you can just compose this like Lego. You can just assemble it in any way you want. It will just do the same, right? So here we take the object foo three for five, extract the array with dot foo, then open up the array in three items, three, then four, then five. Then we bind them in turn to dollar i, and then we evaluate dollar i followed by the square. Who understands this query? Okay. You're doing great because then the rest should be relatively easy if you already understand what this does. But of course, if all the queries you write is this, like a local calculator, it's not really useful because the whole reason why we have a query language and that we are doing all of this is that we want to query actual data, real world data. Where is the real world data? Well, it's stored in S3, in HDFS, in Azure Blob Storage, on your laptop's file system, on the internet, on a website, 
there's many places where it can be stored. And now you see this adds up because we've been working on storage in the first weeks of the semester, right? And this is now what we reuse. Um, so in that case, imagine that I dropped my files on S3, in Amazon S3 in a bucket. It would be exactly the same if I were using HDFS or uh, Azure Blob storage. So all I need to do is give the path to my files. So in the case of S3, it's a URL that starts with S3 colon slash slash, just like HTTP, but S3 instead. And JSON files will just uh, open a file where you have one object per line, one value per line, and then it iterates. For every dollar $i with uh, something in there, return dollar $i. And so this is going to be a sequence of objects, right? And keys is just returning the keys that it finds in there. So imagine that in your data set, in every JSON object, you just have foo and bar as the keys, then keys of all of that is going to return foo and bar. It's great to discover data because if the data is in a relational table, it's easy, right? You already have a schema and, and in the Jupyter notebook, you can click and it gives you directly the schema and the types. But if you have messy data that was just thrown at the data lake, you have no idea what there is in there. You don't know what keys there are. You don't know what types there are. This is why a query like this is useful because then it's going to just over the cluster on plenty of machines, even if there's billions of objects, it's going to return the keys, right? And behind the scene with RumbleDB is going to be Spark that does that, but you don't see it, it's all hidden. Okay. Who understands that query? Right, just iterates over the objects in the files that I have on S3 and then return the key. So there's foo and bar in that case. Okay. Uh, this here is the same with parquet. So imagine that instead of uh, JSON, I have parquet, uh, but that's the same, just looks the same. The only difference of course, is that parquet will be more structured because here you will have a schema. And in fact, you, you, so there is no difference between this and this except for speed. This here is going to be super fast with Parquet. Why? Because Parquet has a schema. So if you want to know the keys in a Parquet file, you don't even need to look at the data. Just look at the schema and you will have the keys, right? That's going to be much faster than this, but the queries look the same. So now I keep counting the languages because when we, when we came up with JSONIC um, 12 years ago now, uh, it was the first. Uh, JSON uh, query language. Uh, now there's 30 because people keep realizing you need a JSON query language, but they just keep reinventing a new one. So we do have a problem. I, I, that, that, that's really a real concern is that for relational tables, there is SQL. It's undisputed. Everybody uses SQL. But for uh, nested heterogeneous data, the market has not consolidated. So we are in the situation that we have all of these languages. The good news is they look more or less the same with a few variations, uh, but it might take time until things uh, start consolidating. So the reason why we did JSONIC in the first place is with the goal to have a standard because actually JSONIC is based on a standard, which is a, a, a W3C standard, just like a HTML. So 90% of JSONIC is a W3C standard. Okay, but again, you will have no difficulty learning another one would be really, really easy. Yes, do we have the... Yeah. So uh, these languages are just to query JSON. JSON. Or XML. Uh, or yeah. XML. JSON, XML, uh, yeah, pretty much. Okay. And you see there, I, I try to count them because there's an, announce, an announcement every couple of weeks with the company announcing yet another language and uh, they all do the same. They all query JSON or XML. I, I hope you remember what I told you on JSON or XML. JSON or XML is the same thing. It's just trees. It doesn't matter if it's the one or the other. It's just, uh, it's just the same idea that the data is nested in the heterogeneous. Okay, so these are all of them. Uh, so now I'm going to present JSONIC to you. Uh, first with the data model, because when you have a language, you need to understand what the language manipulates, right? SQL manipulates relational tables. Well, JSONIC manipulates sequences of items. Um, so what are items? Well, if you look at JSON, this is JSON here. This is familiar to you. You have objects, you have uh, arrays, you have strings, you have numbers, you have booleans, you have nulls, right? We covered that a few weeks ago. Um, well, in JSONIC, everything is a sequence of items. Just like in SQL, everything is a table. 
in JSONIC, everything is a sequence of items. Can be zero items, one item, a billion items, a sequence of items. It can be heterogeneous. This is a big change with SQL because in SQL, you can see a table also as a, as a sequence of rows, right? But all the rows in a table, they all look alike. They have the same columns, they have the same uh, types and so on. Not in JSONIC. JSONIC sequences can be heterogeneous. It means that in the same sequence, you can have a string, an object, an array, a Boolean, another object that doesn't look like the first one. It's totally uh, supporting heterogeneity, right? Out of the box. And it's denormalized because you can nest. Uh, it doesn't have to be flat. You can have objects in objects in objects nested in some of the items without any difficulty, right? Um, sequences of items are flat. I mean that a sequence of, of items is just a sequence of items. So one item is the same thing as a sequence of one item, right? It's called a canonical identification if we have mathematicians, right? So we consider that a sequence of one item is the same. And whenever you try to combine sequences in this way in JSONIC, so you, the, the parentheses and commas, you can actually do it in JSONIC. So if you try to take a sequence of two items and then comma and then a third item, this is just a flat sequence of three. There is no notion of nestedness in a sequence. You cannot nest them. Nestedness is only achieved with objects and arrays. Right. For whom is that clear? Right. So this is actually what allows us to scale because since they are flat, if you have a flat collection of a billion items, that should be familiar to you. We've seen that all over the place during the lecture. RDDs are collections of items. Right, sequences of items. Data frames are sequences of rows possibly nested. Relational tables are collections of rows, uh, and so on and so on and so on. So we, we've seen this idea that in big data, we love to have absolutely gigantic sequences of small items. Right? The names might differ, but it's the idea. Gigantic sequences, millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions of small items. These items here, Again, it's always my same uh, ballpark that I already gave you, typically not more than 10 megabytes for a single item. You don't go beyond a few megabytes. And even a few megabytes is a lot, right? But the number, you can have billions, trillions. That's the idea, okay? Uh, this is the empty sequence. It's fine too. There is nothing in there. It's like the empty table in SQL, if you want. Now, what is an item? Well, an item can be an object. An item can be an array. An item can be an atomic value. Any one of those we covered, string numbers, you know, all of the atomic values. Uh, and functions, but functions I just keep aside because you can actually, this is called higher order functions. Uh, uh, this is actually useful for machine learning because a function can basically encapsulate some machine learning model, but this is not a machine learning lecture. So I'm just uh, keeping that out of the scope. So ignore the functions, don't worry about them atomic values, objects, and arrays, and you can just build sequences of this, okay? And now it's going to be very easy because every single expression in JSONIC takes sequence of items as input and spits sequences of items as output. It's that simple. And then it's a Lego game. You just compose them in any way you want, just like a calculator, okay? Now, what's the power of sequences of items? Well, the power, is in the diversity of sequences of items. Because you can have absolutely heterogeneous sequences like you see on the right of that screen. On the right, you have a sequence of four items. So it can be returned by a JSONIC expression. You see there's an integer, there's a Boolean, there's an object, there's an array, and that's a sequence, and that's fine. Then on the left of that, you see a sequence of arrays. That's a bit more structure in there because these are all arrays, but the arrays have different sizes, right? That's still a sequence of arrays. In the middle, you see a sequence of objects, but they all look alike. They all have a key foo with an integer and a key bar associated with a Boolean. In fact, who agrees that the sequence in the middle is in fact canonically identical to a relational table? Who sees that? This is a table with how many columns? Two columns, foo and bar, and then one, two, three, four, True, false, false, true. So this is what I mean with this generalizes SQL. 
because this now is a special case. That's the SQL case in the middle, except that you can also go to the right with these uh, heterogeneous sequences. And then a sequence of items, and this is something SQL doesn't have, can also be a sequence of Booleans, or it can be a sequence of integers that works too. Or it can be just one single value, just a string foo, that also works, just a single number that's called a scalar in SQL, uh, or it can be empty. And so you have the whole spectrum from highly structured all the way to unstructured, a huge mess, just a huge mess. Right? And the reason why this spectrum is useful is that in real life, it's commonly done actually for people who do data science or analytics, the real life gives you this in the internet. If you try to query data from logs and so on, it's going to be a mess like this. And you need a way to clean that up and turn it into something a bit more structured because this is what you fit then into, a, let's call it a classical machine learning algorithm. You need something structured like that. I'm not talking about deep learning and these things, but there is a direct use case of taking messy data using a language like JSON to clean it up into a sequence like that. And then you fit that in machine learning. All right. Um, so, now that we've established what the data model is, sequences of items, billions, trillions of items, then we can start using JSONIC. So the best way to start usually is to navigate JSON. This is quite uh, an intuitive thing to do. So this here on the left is a JSONIC query. Um, JSON doc opens a file that contains JSON Typically it's, going, typically, it's going to be a JSON object. But this is not a JSON lines file. Remember, in JSON lines files, you have one object per line, and you can have a lot of them. JSON doc is more like just one object, but all spread over a thousand lines, right? With new lines and fancy formatting to make it readable by a human, right? So you have JSON files like this that are just an object spread over many lines. So JSON doc opens it, and this is what you have on the right. Pretty printed, so I, I put plenty of tabulations and uh, returns in such a way that it looks nice, but that's actually just like the original file could be. So you can see this is one single JSON object. It fits in the data model, right? Because this is a sequence of one item that is a JSON object, right? So this fits in the data model. So now this is easy. We have these outputs. Now I'm going to do this dot countries. Now the dot countries should be familiar to you because if you've been using Java or Python or JavaScript, then this dot syntax in the object-oriented programming, at least for those of you who saw it, should be a bit familiar. So what does that do? Dot countries navigates to the key called countries. So what does that read? That's, what does it return? Well, it returns the value that is associated with countries, and you can see this is an array. I put the rectangle on the right. So this returns an array that contains whatever it contains, in that case, five objects. This is, again, a sequence of one item, and that item is an array. Who is following? OK. Now, this. Well, we know, we've already seen it in the appetizer. It's these double square brackets. What does it do? It opens the box. It's like opening your Christmas presents, right? So f here, the array is kind of closed. It's boxed. It's a single array, and you pop it open, just like that, right? So now, what do we have? We have a sequence of five items. It's a sequence of five items, and they are all these five items. They are all objects, right? So it's a sequence of five object items. And then you see the magic now. I can continue with dot name, but there's something new happening here, because when we did dot countries, we did it on a single object. Now I'm applying this dot name on a sequence of multiple objects. What happens? Well, I'm going to take the value associated with name for every single one of my five objects. So the first object, we get Switzerland, the second one, France, and Germany, Italy, Austria. So what we get out of, the, of this query is also yet another sequence of items. In this case, I have how many items? Five, yes. And what are these items? Strings, right? Atomic items. So it's a sequence of five strings. So it all, all fits in the data model. These are all sequences of items. I could do it with codes too, would work just the same. 
Now I can also filter. What if I want to filter only these countries that have the code CH? Well, I can just put a test in there, some predicate. And my predicate that I put in the square bracket says the code must be equal to CH. So code equals CH. What is this dollar dollar? It's the current item being tested. When you have a filter like that, it's like a filtering. If you want to relate it to Spark, that's the filter uh, uh, transformation. We want to filter that sequence of objects. And dollar dollar is the current object being tested. And for that current object, I want the code to be CH. So it's going to return true for the first one and false, 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 false for the other ones, right? This comparison. So those for which it's false, I throw them away. And the one for which it is true, I return. So now it's a sequence of one item that is this object. And again, I can continue to navigate like this and get Switzerland. It's a sequence of one item that is a string. Right? Who starts feeling how this all works with the navigation? It's very intuitive. Very, very intuitive. Okay. And that, of course, might also remind you of the where clause of SQL, right? But I will I will come back to this. All right. Now, this was JSON doc, because here I opened a small file that just contained one object, right? But with JSON file, I can open gigantic files that contain millions of JSON objects, one per line. So now imagine that I have a, a, a file. It's not gigantic. There's only 200 countries or so, right, in the world. But imagine I have this file with these 200 lines, uh, countries.json, and that's the first five. Then I open it. I get a sequence of 200 objects. Then I filter with this code must be equal to CH for the object being tested. So of course, there's only one country that satisfies this. It's Switzerland. So that only gives me one object, the first one. And that dot name returns Switzerland. Who agrees that the query here returns Switzerland? Okay. It's designed to be intuitive. OK. OK. So this is how you navigate data. So now we're just co going to continue to navigate a little bit, but having a mind discovery. What is this? Um, if I give you a data set and I tell you absolutely nothing about it, you've just downloaded it, you don't know the schema, you don't know the keys, you don't know the, uh, uh, you don't know the, the types in there. And so what typically a, a data scientist is going to do is look at it, open it, analyze it find out what the keys are, what the types are. This is called schema discovery. At the end of that, you might even be able to write some JSON schema once you have figured it out. So let's take a data set. Um, it's the one we'll use at the exam. In fact, it's the GitHub archive data set. But for now, we don't know anything about it. So let's just blindly see what there is in there. So this is now RumbleDB. It actually works. This is something you can actually uh, put if that exact query here. You can copy paste it in the in the in the Jupyter notebook that I showed you earlier. It will work because it's on HTTP, right? So it's on the web. You don't even need S3 or anything for that. So that query is just opening the file located at HTTP rubbledb.org samples git archive JSON. This is not a namespace. This is an actual location. This is an actual file. If you, you can actually does anybody have a laptop? Can you try to put this URL, HTTPS, blah, 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 in your browser? You put it in your browser, the file will, the, the file will, up, will uh, appear on your screen. So it is on, on the web. So RumbleDB can read from the web. It's going to download that file. And JSON file, so it's going to open it as a sequence of objects, because the JSON lines file is a sequence of objects. And it's just going to print them on your screen. But of course. If you have a million objects, you cannot print them on the screen so easily. So what's going to happen is that there is a warning that says, hey, 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 be careful. You have more than 200 in there. In that case, there's even 36,577. So it says, as a warning, you know, I'm only showing the first 200. You can actually change the number 200, but it's just for your own sake, right, to not crash your machine. All right. So now it just returns. This is, in that case, the first characters of the first object, because it's actually very big, but this is what happens. So you can just do that. And then you can say, OK, let's look at the first object, right? So with the square bracket 1, I'm just picking the first one. We start counting at 1 in json -E. So 1 outputs the first item in the sequence. And this is it. That's my complete object. It's a sequence of one item that is an object. Now, that should be known to you, keys. I already told you what that does. Keys takes a sequence, 
and it outputs all of the keys that there are in there with duplicate elimination. It will not repeat keys if there are multiple times. So this is great for schema discovery because I know absolutely nothing about that file, gitarchive.json, but with this simple queries, keys JSON file, I can know what the keys are. These are my columns, if you want to see it as a relational table, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight keys. It's like eight columns, right? And we get that just like this. It doesn't matter if there is one object, a million objects, a billion objects, it's the same query. Always work like this. Of course, a billion object is not going to work with HTTP. Uh, if you try to download terabytes of data over HTTP, I don't think your browser can do that. But if you are on S3 or HDFS, a billion is no problem at all. We, we've tested it. Okay. And then this is something you saw too. Dot type is navigating to get the value associated with type for every object. So what we are doing here is type is one of the keys, right? Look, it's the fifth key. So dot type, I'm exploring. And now I see that it seems to be always a string. Well, I don't know because there's billions, right? So there could be also something else than strings, right? But the first ones look like strings, right? So it's still a sequence of items. It's a sequence of strings. Now I see duplicates in there, push event, push event, push event. What if I would like to do to know the unique strings, the unique values that I have? Well, I just add distinct values. It's also a function call. And now I have my distinct values. And you see, there's not so many of them, actually. There's like maybe 15 of them, right? So you see how it's easy to explore the data set. What I have learned here is that there are eight keys at the top level of my data set. And now I know that the first key, it's always a string, and it's one of these, right? Who is following? Now I can count things. For example, imagine that I look at the distinct values of created at. Created at is one of the keys too, you see? The sixth one, created at. So let me do the same with created at with the distinct values, but then I don't want to display them. There are too many of them. So let me count them. So I count the distinct values of created at, and it tells me there are 3,597 of them. I've also learned something about the data set. Now I can also count the total number of objects in my file, but that I already knew from the warning earlier, right? It already told me there's 36,577, but you can also do this, right? So you can count and know the size of your collection. Now, this is small, uh, 10,000, 30,000, this is really not a lot. So I tried with a bigger one that I call Git Archive Big, but this one is not on the internet. I think it's, it might be actually, I'm not sure. It might also be there, but... I put it typically on my own machine, on my laptop, right? So this is why I have this, just this relative path here. And now I have 206,978, right? This is relatively quick to actually execute. Now, what if it's not enough? Well, actually you can download more of them. There is one big file for every hour that GitHub generates. It's a huge amount, even an entire month is a lot of data. So what I did is I downloaded plenty of them. WGET is just a utility to download from the internet. Uh, it's a compressed thing, but compressed is no problem at all. And then I just put all of these files that I downloaded, I downloaded, an, uh, I think maybe a day I did. So I downloaded an entire day, or was it a month? I can't exactly remember because I just put everything I could, let, let's say everything I could download. I just downloaded a lot. I put it in there somewhere, and now I'm seeing JSON file of everything. The star is basically just saying everything.json.gz. And now it's telling me uh, 2 billion, 13 million, 245,097. Two, 2 billion. That was on my laptop. That was on my laptop. So it took a while. Of course, it didn't execute in just a few seconds. I think it took a few minutes, but it works, right? And you see, it's the same query. If it's small, if it's big, count of JSON file is the same query. I can also do it on a cluster with S3, with dozens of billions and even more. Okay. Time for a break. See that it's, uh, it's nine, right? We'll just continue like that. I'm just going to showcase you and uh, drive you into all of the uh, all of the way that JSONIC works. And you'll have exercises. You can use the, this uh, try it out sandbox. So see you in uh, um, in 15 minutes. What so 16 past uh, nine?